All right, welcome back. This is 1130, the Tiger Video Podcast. I am Dylan Marsh, and today we are joined with AD. What's going on, everyone? He's gonna, we're going to be discussing uh, all the All-Star games and, uh, and each sport, and specifically today, because tonight is the 87th MLB All-Star game in San Diego with uh, Mike Trout looking for his third All-Star game MVP, something that has never been done, which I'm sure he's going to do, considering he's only 25 years old. Uh, we're going to be talking that. We're going to be talking uh, UFC 200. We're going to be talking NBA free agency, if we, if we can get to that. But first, let's start off with uh, our rants about the All-Star game. I know me and you have some different views on All-Star games. We're going to start off with the one that's tonight, the uh, MLB All-Star game. And I feel like it's the most important one, but doesn't get the most attention. Because the, the winner of this game, American League or National League, determines home field advantage. In the World Series. In the World Series, yes. And you don't agree with that? No, I don't. I, I feel that the All-Star game is based off the best players playing together in, in a showcase mode. And the World Series is the two best teams going at it to be crowned the you know the best team in the MLB. Yeah. And the, the World Series should be off best team, not best player. And to award the, the home field advantage to whichever conference wins, say, say the team in the AL wins the All-Star game. They have home field advantage in the World Series. But the NL team is the – say they're the better team. And if the AL team wins in the World Series, the NL team, I feel they should have a right to be upset to say they have the better record in the regular season. Okay. All right, yeah, I see where you're coming at from that. But what if it turns – somehow all the great players go and play for one team? Kind of like how the NBA is doing right now. Let's say Golden State Warriors for the next five years – had the best record, and they went for the, they went to say they win the finals for the next five years. I have a absolutely have a feeling that they probably just win one. But I, I we're not I, talking about basketball right now. Yeah. We're t- <laughs> we it's I feel like if you have a super team like the Warriors or the Cavs, that it's just yes, it's a team game, but I feel like it's it makes the All Star game more competitive. It makes you know, it gives us, yes, these players need their breaks in the middle of the season. But it gives us something to do while that break's going on. Because there are people in their lives who have nothing to do except watch sports. <laughs> it's kind of like me during football season whenever there's a bye week for my team. I don't know what I'm doing. Fancy football. Fancy football, yes. <laughs> but uh, with with that said, I feel like being... An All Star Game. I like how it's so competitive in the major leagues because it means something. Everybody on the best teams, every usually the best teams in the major in baseball have the most All Stars on their team. Usually, uh, it, you know the Royals a couple years ago, the Cubs this year. The, the Cubs whole this starting year. infield for the National League is the Cubs. Is the All Star team. And with that, I feel is it shows. Yes, yes, they're the best team. They can show it because they have the best players. But I think it. I, I like how they how they do this because it keeps it interesting. And it, it does offer significance. Yeah, too. Because keeps it interesting for the All Star Game. People actually get competitive. People actually get mad during the All Star Game. And another thing about the baseball All Star Game is you see people. I know if you don't watch baseball, this isn't a, this isn't like a big deal for you, but for someone like me who watches baseball, watching someone like Bryce Harper bat second in an order compared to third or fourth like he does with the Nationals, he's batting second for the National League All-Star team this year. And it's it's just seeing something different, you know? And you see these people come up to the plate that could hit a home run anytime coming up and going up against the best pitchers in the league. And... It does create a bit of unpredictability it, yeah. that makes it exciting. And I, I like it because it brings these players to a whole new level while they're playing with a whole new level, I guess you could say. Yes, the major leagues the highest you can go, the biggest competition. Uh, yeah. But it's the biggest competition put into one. And with, with that said, it's like going into the NBA All-Star game. Like you said, it's it's just a showcase. It's just a showcase. It's a showcase of talent. And when it comes to that, it's, you know, NBA is the best record. Yeah, it's home, home court advantage, Rightfully right? Rightfully so, yes. And this year it was the Warriors, which didn't really 
mean anything for them because they lost at home in Game 7. In the end, yes. But I will say it was against the greatest player in the world right now with LeBron James. Uh, but the NBA, be, the, I'm sorry, the NBA All-Star game is no defense, all threes. All dunks. And if there's a, a steal or someone wide open, no one tries to go and block it. The only person running is the one with the ball. Exactly. And you, you will see that if you watch the game. You will see someone jogging down the court, getting ready to do a 360 dunk while the person closest to him standing at the half-court lines is, oh. I'm and, surprised they don't just combine the teams and just do a whole dunk contest with the All-Stars in a three-point shootout. That's what they need to do. Yeah, I think – I'm going to get to what I think the NFL Pro Bowl is in a minute, which is a joke. But what could happen in the NBA is to make it just any more interesting – is yes, it's the fan favorite. It's the and most I popular think, of the three. Yeah, and I think the slam dunk contest and the three point contest have something to do with that. But what if they do what they're doing with the Pro Bowl now, which is have a fantasy draft for the All Star team? It is interesting. And let's say you have two, like two, like just like the NFL does. They usually Michael Irvin's, I think, always been a coach, and then you have like Jerry Rice. Or someone like that. Let's you can, say you can bring back like Michael Jordan. Yeah. You or someone who's Bird. not involved in the NBA. Yes. Because like, he's an owner. Let's say you have John Stockton. John, I was about to say, I was just about to say John Stockton. And let's go with like Scottie Pippen. Let's say they just have a fantasy draft of who got voted into the All Star game. They just picked from like the twenty players. Yeah. If they're not gonna make it any significance of the so East versus West and how the finals go or anything. Make it more entertaining than it already is because this would be really great to see with, you know, I know it's already fun, but like what you were telling me earlier, put some uh, money down on it. The salary cap incentives. Yeah, put, yeah I yeah, think it would, about that. it would definitely make it more competitive if keeping it, you know, east-west versus each other. If the winning side, all the teams that are in, say the, say the Western Conference wins the All-Star game, all the teams in the Western Conference would have – about a five to ten increase in their salary cap just for that coming off season. So like after that off season's over, it would go back down to the regular. But I think it would offer, you know, an incentive to those players because you would have more money to possibly spend on your own contract in that off season if you're looking for an extension or signing a new one, or you could sign better free agents to help your team win. So it it fixes two things. Are are you saying that every team in the east or west would get Five, like, let's say, what, five million more dollars? Yeah, five to ten in that range. Because so basically, contracts nowadays, five million is not much. Okay. Uh, but then that brings up the thing of the players getting so much money to where they might not really care. It's more along the lines of the organizations wanting that money. And yes, they, they play for that organization, but, you know, it could help a little bit with the competitiveness. Uh, so it's NBA, it's just. It's the best All Star game, I guess, besides baseball, of like entertainment wise, because mm-hmm. a lot of people don't want to sit and watch baseball. Um, but the NFL is a catastrophe right now with the Pro Bowl. It's, it's like you said, a joke. It is a joke. I I don't know anyone who personally watches the Pro Bowl. Yeah, well, I watched the first year they had a fantasy draft because I thought that was extremely interesting and in how they have two former Hall of Famers they they draft mm-hmm. a team, which I think helped, but it still doesn't help the competitiveness. Because in in NFL, they flip flop between AFC and NFC, who gets to beat a home and away team, but they play at a neutral site, so it does not matter. So, I, do they just have this game for the players? Because I, I know it's not for the fans, because <laughs> the fans don't exactly. care much they, about it. They tried to make it more entertaining with the fantasy draft, and it did. But I don't see what else you could do with it because they already have. Because I don't think this is for the players. Because they already have the all NFL team. Yes, you get make it to a Pro Bowl and you get a free trip to Hawaii. And yes, it might be something for like long snappers if they make the Pro Bowl. Because I know they do that. That someone who never gets recognized gets to go to a Pro Bowl and gets to go to or like offensive linemen. Yeah, offensive line people who aren't skilled players who don't get a lot of attention. Yeah, this is an accolade for them. But a lot of them are aiming for making either the Super Bowl or making an all NFL or all pro team. And I just feel like this game isn't helping either side of the players or the fans. It's just a money grab for the NFL at this it's point. exactly what it is. It's more money for the NFL, which has been the 
talk about, you know, with Roger Goodell, just money, money, money. And all that's getting covered up with the whole CTE stuff. And But the NFL is so greedy for money that they, they do this. They, uh, a lot of players don't play in the Pro Bowl because they don't even want to get injured for, like, next season and stuff like that. And most of the top players aren't playing in the Pro Bowl anyway because they are in the Super Bowl the week later. Exactly. to play in it, like the league MVP, Cam Newton. Yeah. Which I don't have a problem them switching it a week before the Super Bowl. But yes, because it gives us something to watch during that week of us just dying for the Super Bowl Instead to come Instead of around. just coverage and predictions. Yes, yeah. And, you know, if I just feel with, this, with the Pro Bowl, it's, yeah, it's there for money, but it's the softest off-star game I've ever seen because no one tackles hard. Like, they don't, they don't tackle like they would in regular season. You don't see hard hits. You don't see quarterbacks really getting sacked. J.J. Watt is the only person I actually remember seeing getting a sack in that game. And that's just because he's just so excited to be there because he has such a love for the game. It's crazy. And it's running backs don't get a lot of, you know, playing time because it's more of just... Cares. Just pass, throw the ball, touch it's down. Basically, it's basically a quarterback's accuracy with a battle between the quarterbacks and receivers. And it's just basically who can chunk it downfield, and who can score the most points. And that's all most of the All Star games, aside from the MLB winners, just score the most points. Don't yeah. stop the other team, score the most exactly. points. Exactly. It's an entertainment thing, an especially for race. the NFL with the 20 people to actually watch it and the 85 people that are actually at the game. <laughs> it's. I think the the NFL, the Pro Bowl, Pro Bowl it's, it's not a weekend. It's just a day, correct? Yeah. Just the Pro Bowl day. I think yeah, they well, added they, like but a, they do show the practices from the Pro Bowl. They they don't have skills challenges that they do, like because no, like, you know how don't. in the NFL I mean not the NFL the NBA has you know the dunk contest yeah. the three point contest. Well, I think it'd be I think it'd be interesting to showcase like how you know how some wide receivers in college they played quarterback, mm-hmm. you know to maybe put them into some you know quarterback skill challenges. Yeah, that would definitely. I mean, it's just it's just something more fun. It's more interesting. Yeah, exactly. They could put they could easily have like a, a weekend thing, or they could have oh a, like it's all star weekend. And the yeah. NBA and the and the MLB has the home run derby on one day, and the All Star game on the next. Yeah, but it's just kind of hard to think like what could they do besides that instead of do, just doing like outrageous things, you know, like having a receiver play quarterback or something. Like the one thing I actually do enjoy watching during the Pro Bowl, they do have the celebrity versus legends game, where they have celebrity and legends yes, together. Yes, that's yes. that's actually pretty interesting, but that's I just feel like having the MLB All Star game means something. I think that's what ha- having it actually affect yeah. you know the sport. With, the, with NFL, it's fine. Super Bowl is perfect. Having a neutral site is perfect. I don't think I don't care who's home or away. Some players might care what color they wear because they're kind of superstitious about that kind of stuff. But the All Star games are just awful. Compared, I, I think the only All Star game I like is the MLB All Star game, which I plan on watching tonight. And uh, it's tonight. Uh, it's it's in San, in beautiful San Diego, some some place I would love to go, in a place where the worst teams played, <laughs> the Padres. But now we're gonna move on to uh, UFC 200, which is something I'm actually really excited to talk about because me and you we watched it at a watch party. Yes. And uh, we're gonna start off with what should have been with Daniel Cormier and John Jones, but turned man. into Daniel Cormier versus the goat. The greatest, the of, all greatest time. of all time, Anderson Silva, yeah. the spider. Yeah, and what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on that? You got to feel for Daniel Cormier because he's been looking toward, forward to this fight for, what, a year and a half, two years now? Because this is the second time it's been canceled. And for the guy to go out and just have to fight some guy on two days' notice, granted it was Anderson Silva, the greatest of all time. He He did what he was supposed to do. He went out and won. But I feel if Anderson Silva had more than two days' notice, it could have changed the entire thing because he came in. He was, you know, he was he-, he wasn't heavy for for his weight class. Yeah, and he was light for the other weight class. And um, like with with Cormier, it it kind of showed he, you know, that he changed his game plan two days ahead of time once he found out Jones wasn't fighting because he was strictly wrestling. Basically. That's all he was doing. He. He threw, I believe, you said, what, 13 strikes? Or he landed 13. Yeah. He he only landed 13 strikes. But that's because you don't want to stand up against Anderson Silva, a dude with the nastiest front kicks in the history of MMA. His legs are as dangerous as some people's hands. Yeah. And 
with that, I understand why he wanted to wrestle. But as you could see, toward the end of the fight, Silva was starting to pound on Cormier just because of his his leg kicks were effective. You could tell that those were hurt. You could hear the pop. I could have swore that Daniel Cormier had, had broken a rib. Yeah. The way he reacted to it. Yeah. And he was very, yeah, he was very uh, accurate with his punches. He, uh, he just could not defend the ground game at all. And with with that, it came along with Silva being on his back for basically four minutes at one time. Out of, out of each round, pretty much. Yeah, and it kind of took him out of the fight. And, yeah, Cormier won in a landslide. But you have to give respect for a two-day notice, Anderson Silva, at his age, just doing what he loves. And that was insane to watch. I'm actually really glad it happened. I would just rather see John Joe's Cormier. It's oh, been I, such I, a dilemma. I, I think everyone would have wanted that. And... I do feel that Jones would have completely obliterated Cormier. Because if Cormier's fighting skills against, like stand, stand stand up game was like that against Jones, Jones would have killed him with a spin around elbow. I'm just because maybe we don't know what Cormier would have had game plan for Jones because he changed it for Silva. But from what we saw, if he came in with the, if that was his game plan, it would yeah. not have been good for him. And if but Jones. Is I would say a better striker than Silva, not like you know leg like leg kicks wise, but better like punch hands. elbows. His hands are so much better than Silva's. He's quicker than Silva, and Cormier couldn't even land a punch on Silva sometimes. And the beginning of the fight, Silva was just his weave game was just insane at the beginning. And I believe the first thing Cormier threw was a head kick, and you just saw Anderson Silva just slightly move his head. Exactly, out of like, that's just, not happening. Yeah, he's like What's that? he wasn't having none of that. Yeah. And that just shows how great he actually is and how it's just natural to him. And he's just one of the greatest of all time, Silva. And I love how he was held on, the sh- on his trainer's shoulders after that fight because I think it shows the greatness of Anderson Silva. And the respect that he commands. Yeah, and just because even Cormier was giving him so much respect after that fight. And yes, he wasn't even close to winning, but he didn't get knocked out, didn't get submitted. <laughs> He fought hard. He was not in fighting shape. No, he came in street body. Yeah, and it's just it just shows how great Silva is. And I honestly think I know his all of his like his reign as champion submitted his legacy, but this also adds to it to show that he's no pushover. Whenever he, he can still go out there and be competitive, he, I feel he. I don't think he's done in the UFC. Mm-hmm. I feel he has he has some prize fights left that he could do. Yeah. But his days as champion, as you said, you know, it's over for there. Yeah. But uh, now we're going to stay on UFC, but switch focus to the freak of nature that I don't know why we don't call him the freak of nature. The beast incarnate. Yeah. But his name is Brock Lesnar. And he was the he turned out to be the main card for UFC 200 against Mark Hunt. This dude's been absent for five years. Five years. 2011. Alistair Overeem. Oh, my goodness. TKO loss, and I, you I think back then he had his diver, diverticulitis, took out I believe it was it twelve inches, twelve inches of, of his colon, of his colon, and and for a guy to have that done and then stay out for five years, and then the stamina to be in UFC is completely different from the yeah. WWE, and completely. he came in, he he looked he looked good, he looked fresh, yeah, he looked really fresh, but what I really was impressed with was how he started off. And yes, it's five years. He didn't. He starting off. He didn't look like he had a lot of ring rust, because as soon as it started off, yes, they were they were they were they were circling around. They were not doing anything for a doing while. Doing the dance. And I think that was just honestly. I think it was even himself. I think has pre-fight jitters, especially for this. I think his adrenaline was pumping high, and that's why I think he got tired mm-hmm. in the the later rounds. Because he did a great job of controlling his breathing. I could tell. Like, you can hear the breathing while you're watching a fight and stuff, but. His take, his wrestling was great. Almost better than when he left. I, probably better than when he left. And I feel like that's what he's been focusing on, especially because he's on this, what was it, a month and a half he's been training. Yeah, to about out. June something. Yeah. And uh, with that, I think he spent most of that time training wrestling. But I, f- I know it's hard to get into UFC shape, conditioning, but later on in the second round when Mark Hunt started landing punches started on making him. making his moves. And... Lesnar couldn't take him down because he was tired. That conditioning was showing right there. But I think in the second round, yes, conditioning was showing, but I think he might have taken a little, okay. Took a, took a breather. Took yeah, a, like I'm going to take a break this round. 
you know, because just right don't that, get knocked out. Just right after that, in the third round, the third so he started taking him down. And he, he laid had it two on. takedowns in the second, in the second, uh, ra- in the third round. I'm third sorry. Round. And yeah, four all together. Yeah, four takedowns all together. How many strikes did he have? Uh, he landed fifty-one. Fifty-one. Of, I don't know how many he took. I th- he landed fifty-one punches, I think, out of one hundred and twenty. And I believe probably you could say about thirty of those, maybe forty, were on the ground. Yeah, and because they didn't stay up long, because he doesn't want to stay up with Mark Hunt, who has one punch power. And whenever he was on the ground, the last time with a, like a minute thirty left, I remember seeing. Basically, Lesnar had him trying to get him into a chokehold. He couldn't get it. But Lesnar was in a perfect position and just, to just pound just wail on, Mark Hunt. on him. It was it was that Frank Mir fight esque. Yes. And with how many punches he was landing on the exact same spot of Mark Hunt's head, you thought that it was about to be a TKO. But Mark Hunt showed he's, how he's tough got a, he is. He has a chin on him. Or a forehead, because that's exactly <laughs> where he was getting punched. He was getting punched right here. And after like I, I want to say it was like 15 punches. You saw a purple, like a red and purple dot start rising up, and Lesnar was just still just hitting him in the same spot for a good 30 seconds. And I, I was honestly surprised that the ref didn't call it because Mark didn't seem like he was. But really... they stood him up after that. Yeah, which is I was like, okay, all right, because that's what the fans wanted. They were chanting, "Stand him up." Yeah, the fans, the fans were not on the ref side the whole night <laughs> no. at all. <laughs> But the ref was on their side because because he wouldn't do it when they were chanting, but he would he would stand the after, fighters yeah, up. Yeah, after. But uh, yeah, with Mark, but with Mark Hunt's fight like stand up ability, I'm I'm glad uh, Lesnar won. I'm not gonna lie, I was really happy to see him win, and I loved what he said after the fight about with all what's going on in the country right now. I loved what he said right there. But did you hear the stories that have been coming out lately about Lesnar when he was in the NFL? Uh, I, I read one recently uh, that Nate, Nate Burleson, I believe, Nate told. Nate Burleson, the receiver. He was a young receiver at the time for the Vikings. But uh, he was telling a story about Brock Lesnar, who played defense of line in the NFL. For, for the, the Minnesota Vikings. Minnesota Vikings. And they're in a, I think it was a preseason game for against the Chiefs. And someone had a cheap shot on the Vikings quarterback, Deva- uh, Devontae Culpepper. Dante. Dante. Dante Cole- Culpepper. Da- Dante Culpepper. And when uh, he came to the sidelines, apparently Brock said, who was Who did that? And I don't know how, if this is even true because of how things line up, but apparently on the next play, I don't know if it was the person or he just did it on the Chiefs team to get back. But as y'all know, he was a WWE superstar for a while before he went to the NFL. Mm-hmm. But basically he went and suplexed a grown man in the NFL in the middle of an NFL game and caused a huge fight. You can find that video on YouTube, Brock Lesnar, Minnesota Vikings fight against the Chiefs, but the camera doesn't catch the suplex. But you know something happened because everyone runs after Lesnar. (laughs) Which is a mistake I would not want to make. Yes, but these are NFL players with gear on who are about his size, (laughs) so I don't think they're worrying that much about it. But... Yo, man, for joining and looking out for more videos. Y'all have a good day.